All right, please notice with me as we come to 1 John chapter 5, reading from verse 9. Reading from verse 9, verse 13 will be the text that we'll use as a springboard to begin our message this morning. I was thinking this past week about this passage. Two weeks ago in both of the missions, Monday night and Wednesday, or Friday night, I had some men come to me after the service and talk to me in reference to their doubts about where they stand with the Lord and not having assurance. And so I brought them to this text. I did not have a long time to speak with them, but I brought them to this text and mentioned to them to settle this, let this be top priority in their lives. And there are many that have doubts. But we're going to speak this morning on the subject of the assurance of salvation. This is not per se a salvation message, but basically to deal with the fruit of salvation, which is assurance. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Heavenly Father, we do ask this morning again, as we do each week and each service, Lord, we ask that thy blessings and thy anointing will be upon the reading of thy Scripture. We pray, Lord, as we come to this text and this book and this subject, we pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, guide us, teach us, Lord. We pray that we be illuminated by thy Holy Spirit and be led by thy word. And, Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I have a number of messages from 1 John, not only a series in 1 John, but a number of messages from this book. I believe that those whom God gives salvation, He also gives assurance, for one cannot exist without the other. God does a work in the hearts of the believer by His Holy Spirit and by His Word, and He imparts to them eternal life. You cannot have something in parted to you and it not affect you and change your life. Amen? Now, no one should live in doubt, fears, uncertainty, suspense, or to just be unsure. No one should have to live that away. And we do not have to live that away. We seek assurance in many things in life. In our physical life, we seek insurance. We have it. We have health insurance. Many do. We have Insurance on our homes, our property, our automobiles, and probably many other things I can't think of at the moment. We seek uh, retirements, investments. Many people have savings. Why? For insurance. We have it for insurance. But not many are seeking assurance when it comes to God. Not many are asking the question, is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Because when we come to the Holy Scripture, there has to be obedience to the gospel in order to have that. Why are there so many professions with no evidence of salvation? Well, notice with me as we come to verse 13, and the verses I read coming up to this passage, verses 9 through verse 12, clearly speaks of the witness of God that He's given to us in His Word about Jesus Christ, clearly tells us that He's given us the record, the record of who that Christ is and what that He accomplished. He clearly tells us in verse 11 
and 12, he says in verse 12, And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Very simple, not complicated. We either have eternal life or we don't. But when we come to verse 13, this has been one of the greatest verses in my life, not only for my own assurance, but also as I witness to others. Yes, I'll go to John 3.16, Romans 10, and many other places. But this has been one of the passages here that's been very important to me because he says in verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, and I want to place emphasis on that word know, this is the key word in the book of First John. It is used about 38 times, about five or six times in this chapter. He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Notice he said that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, that is having full assurance and confidence in your salvation. But he comes back and he says that you may believe. In other words, that you may continue believing. That you may be rooted and established and grounded and settled in the faith. That you may persevere in believing. To be strengthened in your faith. To increase in your faith as in Second Peter Chapter 3 and verse 18. You notice my outline this morning. I've got three things I want to mention to you about the assurance of salvation. And one is that salvation provides a great comfort. We'll get to that in just a moment. Number two, salvation provides a desire for God and His Word. And number three, salvation provides a persevering spirit. I think this is very important because I can't imagine laying my head down on a pillow at night not knowing where I would be in eternity if I were to die. can't imagine doing that. I've been saved for 48 plus years and I've never had doubts about my salvation. Not bragging about that. It's just that when I trusted the Lord, I trusted Him. I put total faith in Him. I repented of my sins. And my life began to change also from that time. When we come to 1 John, we find that it uses the phrase born of God as in verse 1. We're going to read all of these passages later. But it uses the phrase born of God eight times and born of Him once. This book is about assurance. In this book, we find there are certain characteristics and evidences of the children of God that cause them to be identified with God, their Father. There's a difference between profession and possession. There's many professions that, you know, that we had eight professions of faith. And the reason I put it that way, I do believe they got saved, but I don't know for sure. Time will tell. We had in, in the missions I preached two weeks ago. And so I I say we had eight professions of faith. Time will tell whether they possess eternal life within them. When we speak of vital signs, somebody may be rushed into the hospital and put on a table and checked out for vital signs. What about if somebody rushed us into the church and laid us on the altar? Would they be spiritual life? Would they be vital signs of spiritual life? This book is also a warning to anyone who has rejected Jesus Christ. Now notice as we come back here, I want to read verse 13 another time or two before we turn away from it. But the audience, by the way, in 1 John is the children of God. We see this, they're even referred to as the children of God, the sons of God. And the purpose of this book, 1 John, and we talked through this in a verse-by-verse setting, and I've preached many sermons from this book. I've got one sermon alone titled, The Marks of True Believers. But this, the purpose of 1 John in chapter 1 and verse 4, we're going to read that in a few moments, is to promote joy. 
And number two in chapter two, verse one, is to prevent sin. And the third reason is right here in our text in verse 13 is to provide assurance. Assurance. There's nothing greater in life than having assurance. We want job security. We want assurance in many areas of our life. But when we talk about uh, our, our eternal soul, uh, our never dying soul, there's nothing greater than having assurance. Now let's read this again. Notice in verse 13. I want this to resonate with us this morning because this is one of the most important passages in all the Word of God. And he says here in verse 13, these things, these things is not only what he's written in this chapter, but what he's written in the entire book. And there's a lot in this book. And he said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that is, you may have assurance, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that is, continue or persevere in the faith. Now, Let's get into our outline this morning. And the first thing I want you to notice as we turn to chapter 1. Now, we'll be back in this book later. Put your marker there. Uh, we're going to be turning away some, but we're going to be coming back. And uh, But notice in chapter 1, uh, the first point this morning is that salvation provides a great comfort. I want to talk about two words, peace and joy. And the first is we're going to talk about joy. Notice with me as we begin reading from verse 1. I'm going to read the first four verses. He says here, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For life was manifest, for the life, rather, was manifested. We have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now notice in verse 4. Uh, some have referred to this book as the joy book. Again, this book speaks of joy and peace. It speaks of assurance. He says in verse 4, and these things... The things he's just said in verse 1, 2, and 3. That our fellowship is with God the Father and God the Son and with one another as saints, as the family of God. He said, and these things, that is verse 1, 2, and 3, Christ in flesh that came to this earth. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now there's this book is given to the people of God that their joy may be complete and that their joy may be perfect. And we do know that there's joy in the Lord and in salvation. When we think about this in Romans 14 and verse 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, what do we mean by joy? Well, here in this passage, he says, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. We see here the fullness of joy results with the fellowship of the Father and the Son. That's where fullness of joy comes from. And it cannot be separated from fellowship. When we talk about joy and the joy of the Lord, it cannot be separated from the fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. That's where the joy comes from, is our fellowship with God. It is the natural outcome of fellowshipping with God and with His Son and with the saints of God. Now, when we use the word joy, we can use the word cheerfulness, excitement, enthusiasm. It is a gladness of heart when we talk about joy. It is an inward delight in the Lord. It is a, a, a pleasure one feels in his God or her God. It is not rooted in circumstances. Now, I want you to think about this. This joy that we're talking about here is not rooted in circumstances. Many times we're looking for joy and peace and things and circumstances and events. In other words, I've heard people say, and, and, and over the years, and we probably all said it at least once in, in our life or more, that if I could just have this thing, if I could just afford this thing, 
whether it be a house, automobile, or something, if I could just have this, or if I could just do this, or if I could just go there, then I would be happy, that I'd have joy. Well, those things bring temporary satisfaction, but it's very temporary because it fades. Like a kid getting a new toy, you know, there's excitement there, but it fades. So when we talk about joy, here's what I'm getting at this morning. I'm using the term provide in each one of these points here. Salvation provides. In other words, when a person is saved, There's something that is given to them. Not only the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, obviously. Eternal life is given to them, as we just read in chapter 5 and verse 13. But the thing about it is the Lord provides something for those who are truly born again. He provides a great comfort. And I'm only using two words. We could use others. I'm using the word joy and the word peace. Now, that's what the world wants. I mean, I mean, if you were to look at any news or turn on the radio or read an article or whatever, the, uh, we find about chaos and confusion and so forth in our world. The world in general would like, will talk about peace and joy and happiness. And so we find that it is, it is a pleasure one feels in his God and is not rooted in circumstance. And I'll give you an example in just a moment of that. It's not rooted in circumstances. It's a deep down sense of well-being, calm, satisfaction, and contentment. And there's a tremendous amount of verses. I've got several sermons on peace and on joy, so I'm not going to just start turning to a ton of verses, but I'm going to give you some. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 and 7, we find that it, it is characterized by the heavenly host before God. When you see the heavenly host before God and the marriage supper of the Lamb, you see joy and enthusiasm and cheerfulness there. We also, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, Peter's writing to the saints of God. He said, you've never seen Christ, but you love Him. And then he speaks of the joy unspeakable. In other words, that which is beyond full expression. You know, he speaks of that joy that is unspeakable. Also, in 1 Peter chapter 4, as they're going through sufferings and persecutions, he speaks about an exceeding joy that they have. This joy is not based upon circumstances. Um, The word exceeding joy means to pass beyond, surpass, excel, to go beyond the limits. So this is a joy that goes beyond all the limits of circumstances or uh, situations that are in our life. Jesus even prayed in John 15 and verse 11 that his joy would remain in them and that their joy would be full, that it would be complete and be perfect. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10 tells us that joy is the root of our strength. You want to be strong? You don't have to lift weights. Uh, Amen? You don't have to lift weights. Uh, We find that joy is the root of our strength. And we find, now think about this, in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, Jesus Christ had inward joy in the midst of sufferings. Why? Knowing that He was fulfilling the Word of God. He's knowing that when He came to this earth and He went to that cross, it talks about His joy. Yes, He had tears and pain, but He talks about the joy that was set before Him that a church would be born, a bride would be brought forth. So He had His mind focused upon the will of God and the outcome of Him coming to this earth. We find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 46 through 47, and many other places in the book of Acts, that joy was the mark of the early church. I mean, when the church is born in Acts chapter 2, we see the issue of the rejoicing and and the just the rejoicing in the Lord. We see this again in chapter five. We see it in First Thessalonians one six. They receive the word of God in affliction in much joy, not based upon circumstances. We also find in Galatians five and verse twenty two that this joy is produced supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. It is, it is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, it is not a result of human efforts. So, when God saves an individual, and I know this to be true. See, I can bring this to you this morning by the Word of God. 
But I also can bring this message to you by experience. So everything I'm going to talk about, I can use His Word, and I can use uh, my own experience. And so when God saves an individual and they're truly repented of their sins and they've trusted Christ as their Savior, He puts His Spirit, His divine nature within them, and He gives them a comfort, a peace, a joy that they have never experienced before in their life. And I can tell you that from day one, May the 15th, 1972. There's something that happens that uh, that is wonderful and uh, that you never get over it. Now, notice with me, um, as we turn to Romans chapter 2, we're going to turn away from the book a little bit. Notice in Romans chapter 2. My oldest grandson was telling me that he had taken a trip to Boston. And he's telling me, uh, taking a tour there in Boston, a tour of the city. And, uh, and, I was, and, and he went to see the, the Constitution, different things. He said, have you ever seen that? I said, yeah, I've seen it. But I said, I went to seminary in Boston. He said, you did? I didn't know that. I said, yes. I said, our ship pulled in there, in USS Lexington, for three months. Actually, a little longer. We ran aground coming out and had to spend a little time there. But anyway, I said, I said, yeah, I went to seminary there. I said, I hadn't been saved a long time, and, and we started a Bible study on the, uh, on the aircraft carrier. And, uh, and when we pulled in to Boston, Massachusetts, we would work eight, ten hours a day. And then there was a group of us. We, um, a group of us got together every night. And uh, we spent from 6 to about midnight in Bible study. And uh, except for one break, the last spring truck come around, we got us a Sunday every night, seven days a week. We did that for three months. And I said, yeah, I went to seminary there. Absolutely. Well, you know why that, that was so important to me? I was the one that initiated it. I was the one that got the teacher and got the chapel. And uh, I wanted the Word of God. I was 19 years of age. Uh, all I'd ever lived for is myself and the world. I'd never, uh, I'd never prayed to God. I'd never looked into His Word. Never opened a Bible. Never owned one. And and I'll tell you that when God saved me, that changed some things. I had new desires and new hungers. And so God provides a great comfort for those who truly save. And and the lost world doesn't understand this. Now, let's look in Romans chapter 5. Let's read verse 1 and 2 together. And notice this. And we've got the word peace and the word joy in, in, in both of these passages. And by the way, joy, one said, is the flag flown when Christ the King is on the throne of the heart. How true that is. And again, many people are looking for joy and many other things, and it'll really get long-lasting joy. Notice in Romans chapter 5, in Romans chapter 5, he says in verse 1 and 2, said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So there's our joy. There's our peace. Notice he says in verse 2 that, that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is something that God puts within us. And it says here in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, peace is the opposite of anxiety. It has to do with the state of the soul. It has to do with calmness, quietness, tranquility, harmony, well-being, soundness, and freedom from disturbance. We find that it gives rest to the soul and peace and contentment to the mind. And that's exactly what God does. Many passages in the Bible that speak of this. You'll never find any true peace in the political arena. It's constant turmoil. I've told you several times in the last four or five years, or maybe the last 20 years, all of my life, all of my life, I'm, I'm nearly 68 years of age, all of my life, all I've ever heard is that this election is the crossroads 
this changes everything. I've heard that every election in my life, 60, nearly 68 years. Well, I don't find peace in the political arena. I do not. And I'm looking to my God. I told a man on the phone about two weeks ago. I said, when, when Uzziah died, God gave Isaiah a vision that the king is still on the throne in heaven. I may preach an election sermon when we get closer to November. I mean, and to keep our eyes upon this, because men come and go. We will also leave this world one day too. But there's a king that's still sitting on the throne in heaven. I'm going to trust him. By the way, we find that peace doesn't come from the world. Jesus said in the book of John, the upper room, he said that uh, you'll have tribulation in this world. He said you find peace uh, in me, he says. And we find that throughout the scriptures. Look at all the scriptures that we we can go to, and we'll go to a few of those in a moment, where that, that people found peace. We, we could look at Zacchaeus, Mary Magdalene, the Apostle Paul that was Saul of Tarsus, Anna, Simeon. We just go through a list of people that found the peace of God in their hearts. Philippians chapter 4. Not only do we have peace here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, by being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, I know you're very familiar with this. We've read it many times. You've probably read it many times on your own. We find that I'm just going to read just a few verses from there and going to give you a few other verses before we uh, turn away from this point. But in Philippians chapter 4, I love this. We have the peace uh, with God by being justified, the, by being declared righteous in Christ. But we also have the peace of God by following Him and trusting Him. It begins in Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He said, Let your moderation be known in all men. The Lord is at hand. That means He's at hand to help us and to comfort us and and available to us. He said in verse 5, Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't be anxious. Be careful for nothing, but in everything in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That word keep, I've said this a hundred times here, that word keep means to guard. In other words, when we, when we bring everything to God, we give it all to Him, the peace of God that passes all understanding, it will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We also find, if you're taking notes, Psalms 119 and verse 165, that great peace that, that people can have, that they'll never have disturbance in their life. It's a great quality of abundance, that great peace, great peace. And then there's that perfect peace in Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4, undisturbed peace. Where does that come from? Isaiah 32, verse 17 and 18 says it's a result of righteousness. A result of being declared righteous. Romans 3.17, the way of peace they have not known. The lost do not know the way of peace. They have no true peace in their heart. And in Isaiah 57 and verse 12, there is no peace, saith God, to the wicked. So the lost do not have the peace that we're talking about right now. So number point number one is that salvation provides a great comfort. It brings assurance to the heart and it gives to us peace and joy um, in our Christian life. Now notice the second thing. Turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter in chapter 1, the second thing I want to point out is that salvation provides a desire for God. You ever wonder why people don't have a desire for God? Because they're not saved. You ever wonder why people don't want to read their Bible? Don't want to pray? Don't want to be in the house of God? Because they're not saved. Notice with me in Second Peter chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. You see, before salvation... Again, I can bring this to you by the Word of God. I can bring this to you by experience, by life experience. 
Before salvation, I had no interest in the Word of God. I had no interest in prayer. I had no interest in church. I really did not even have any interest in being around Christian people. I wanted to be around the people like me, that is, that were lost. And they talked about the things of the world. That's the way I was. After salvation, I could not get enough of God and His Word to this day. To this day. Now notice as we come to this text, we're talking about salvation provides. This is something God gives. Now see, what I'm talking about is assurance. The assurance of salvation. What does God give us when we get saved? He gives us comfort, peace, and joy. What does He give us? He gives us a desire. I never had a desire for God before. Never had that. But once I became a new creature, became very hungry for the things of God. As a matter of fact, I got up and walked from the naval base, from the ship and to the commissary. I walked and bought my first Bible. I walked and hitchhiked to church. You know, there was nothing going to keep me from this. And some people can either take it or leave it. Notice, he says, beginning in verse 1, Simon Peter's servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, verse 3 and 4 is the two I want to emphasize. He says in verse 3, According as his divine power, and that's the Holy Spirit, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, verse 4, whereby are given unto us. Now, notice God has given something to us which are saved. And He said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Please notice, underline it, highlight it, the divine nature. We have in verse 3 the divine power. And then in verse 4 we have the divine nature. Those who are born again, those who are saved, God gives them a divine Nature, that is, we are partakers of God's nature. His very life and nature dwells in us by the Holy Spirit. We have become new creatures. And there's many verses in the book of Corinthians and the book of Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians that bear this out. Speaks of the new man in contrast to the old man. It speaks of what we have in Christ, new life. We are new creatures. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I can tell you that from the Word of God and tell you that from experiences. There was things that were not important to me anymore after I got saved. Now, we have to grow. We have to mature in our faith. But there's things that became very, very, very important to me. New life brings new likes and new desires and new behaviors. I mean, that's that's just a fact. In other words, we are changed as becoming new creatures. We resemble our Father. And uh, nature determines many things. It determines appetites, desires, and behaviors. We have a new nature, a divine nature, a divine power that has been placed within us. Let me illustrate that. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice in 1 Peter in chapter 2, we are no longer a child of wrath dominated or controlled by the Adamic nature. We still possess the Adamic nature. It's called the flesh in some cases. As in Galatians 5.16, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. But we are no longer a children, uh, a child rather of wrath and we are not controlled by our Adamic nature. By this divine nature, we are lifted up above that and we can live for God. In other words, we love the things that God loves and we hate the things that God hates. And there's a clear difference between a sheep and a goat. 
Now notice in 1 Peter in chapter 2, let me read the first three verses and then come back and focus in on verse 2. He says here, beginning in verse 1, he says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envyings and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Verse 3, If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now notice he mentions in verse 2, newborn babes. He tells us what we're not to do in verse 1. He tells us what we are to do in verse 2. And then he asks if we have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now notice as newborn babes, we know that new life needs nourishment, whether it be physical life or spiritual life. It must have nourishment. And notice he says in verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We find that we, that God will place a desire in us for spiritual growth, for spiritual things, for the word of God. In other words, think about this. A child is physically born into this world with an appetite. Can I get an amen? You can't stop it. As a matter of fact, if you try to stop it, that child will scream for it. Amen? So a child is born physically into this world with a physical appetite. Guess what? When we come to the Scripture, a child of God is born spiritually with a appetite. In other words, they now have a desire for the things of God that they never had before. They want His Word, they want His truth, they want His will and His direction in their life. And when he mentions here the sincere milk of the Word, we find that the the pure milk of the Word, we find that milk is a perfect food for a child and the Word of God is a perfect food spiritually for you and I. We find that, and he says that you may grow thereby, again as in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Back in June, we preached from Matthew 5 and verse 6, a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so I just want to make mention of this passage. You see, hunger and thirst are daily needs. Not only is hunger and thirst a daily needs, but they're the most demanding need that we have in our life. We must eat and drink or we will die physically. And so we find that in the child of God, hunger and thirst is a daily need, spiritually speaking, for God and for His Word and prayer and fellowship and communion with Him. They want it, they desire it, just like the child desires a sincere milk of the Word. This is one of the evidence of somebody truly being born again. They, they really want the truth. They desire it. They hunger for it. They'll get into the Word. They'll pray. They'll seek God. They'll be in places where that they can be taught. We find here in Matthew chapter 5, just one verse. Notice this. He said, Blessed are, and verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is a spiritual hunger and thirst. It speaks of a strong desire, a deep craving. It means to yearn for or to long for. In other words, to be desperate for this. I mean, you get hungry enough, you get desperate. And you'll find food and drink. The same is true of the child of God. They will hunger and they will thirst for the things of God. Let me illustrate that with some passage you already know. But turn with me to the book of Psalms and notice with me in Psalms 119. I want to show you the cry of those who are truly Children of God. Psalms 119. And I'm going to come, first of all, to verse 97. You see, in Matthew 4 and verse 4, the Lord Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. In other words, if a person can take it or leave it, they probably need to be saved. Amen? Now notice here in this passage, And one of the reasons most never grow spiritually is because they're not hungry. They're not thirsty. 
You know, Jesus even told uh, the people, even disciples that were following him. He said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you know, and he's not obviously talking about physically, he's talking about in a spiritual sense. He said, he said, basically, you cannot have eternal life. You cannot truly be my disciple. We find in John 6, there are those that turned and walked away from him after he said that. Why? They didn't want the commitment. They did not want the truth. Now, they loved seeing the miracles. They loved seeing that. Some of them even enjoyed eating the food that Christ had brought about to them. And they were fascinated at Jesus, but they did not want to follow Him and to be a part of Him. In Psalms 119, this is David. I'm just picking out a few verses here. And and I'm just showing you that when, when, when salvation comes to an individual, that salvation provides a hunger and desire for God and His Word. It provide, in other words, God gives this and put it in within us. I didn't have it before. I didn't want it. I didn't seek it. I didn't follow after it. But once conversion took place, God put this within my heart and soul. And He puts it in every Christian. When people can take the Word of God or leave it, when they, when they just have no interest in it, you can rest assured that they need to be born again. Now, notice in Psalms 119, I'm reading in verse 97, and he says here in verse 97, he said, Oh, how love I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. And then in verse 99, he said, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Again, in Psalms 100, well, let's, let's drop down. Notice in Psalms 103, he says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You know what most are saying? Well, that's hard sayings. That's what they said unto Jesus. When Jesus said, You must eat of my flesh and drink my blood, they said, This is a hard saying. I hear that too as I try to preach and teach. Well, that's just a little too hard. That's a little too difficult. No, you just need conversion. Need need the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God will say, Oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation. And and it will say also, uh, as in Psalms uh, 119, 100, it says, uh, well, not, I'm sorry, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, as sweeter than honey to my mouth. The Spirit of God within us says those things. In other words, that divine nature that is within us desires these things. Notice in Psalm 63, very familiar psalm. This is David again. This is David. You know, I think about some, even in the New Testament, I think about Zacchaeus. I mentioned him a moment ago. Zacchaeus, as Jesus was coming into Jericho, Zacchaeus was a short fellow. And so the crowds are all around. He couldn't see Jesus. And he said he was of small or little stature. And so he assured it. And, and, and so he climbed up in a sycamore tree. He wanted to see the Savior. And the Savior told him to come down. In other words, Savior seen his interest. And Zacchaeus was in such a state of ready for conversion. He said, he said, he said I'll give half of my goods to the poor. Now, that's, that's, you're ready for salvation. And he said, if I've done anybody wrong, I'm putting this in my own words, he said, he said, I'll even pay them back, you know, even fourfold of what I've taken from them. You know what the Lord said in Luke 19, 9? He said, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. He was a true son of Abraham, as we are in Christ. In other words, Zacchaeus I mean, when he saw the Savior and met the Savior, not only was he converted and changed, I mean, his life was radically changed. He was a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. And his life was radically changed. I think about the blind Bartimaeus in, uh, in Luke 18, 35-43, as, uh, as the Lord Jesus was coming into another city, Jerusalem. We find that... Um, uh, that he heard, and the, all, all again, the crowds are there, and he heard that the Messiah was coming through. And he started crying out for mercy, and they said, shut up, and he wouldn't shut up. 
He just kept, he got louder. Why? Because that was his day of not only healing, but his day of conversion. And he went away rejoicing. John 1.12, it says that the Lord gives us the power to become a child of God. He says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God gives us the power through the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation, through the Spirit. God gives us the power to become sons of God and daughters of God because we don't have the power within ourselves. We must come to Him in repentance and faith and humility. Notice in Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1, David again, when he was in the wilderness, says, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee, My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in the dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because of thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. This will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. This king, this warrior, got quite a tender heart here, doesn't he? He's crying out, hungering for God, thirsting for God. And then we see again in chapter 42, A very similar testimony in chapter 42. I'm going to turn here and then go back to the New Testament. In chapter 42, the first few verses, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I have gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise and with a multitude that keep holy day. Again, the writer. The writer here is crying out. And he's a thirst for God as a, as a deer panting for the water brook, and has been probably running and whatever, needing some water. He says, this is the way I am. Lord, I want you. So God provides a desire for him. Salvation brings assurance and provides a desire for God, for his word, his people, his house. You don't have to muster that up. You see, when we get saved, God puts that within us. And we'll spend the rest of our life pursuing Him and seeking Him for the rest of our life. Again, most never grow because they never have a hunger. And many are not even saved to begin with. Turn with me back to 1 John in chapter 5. And notice here, 1 John chapter 5. See, these are things, these are things that God does for us when He saves us. He gives us comfort, peace, and joy. And He gives us a desire. He gives us a hunger and a thirst in our soul and that we follow after Him, we pursue Him. Now this comes to a third point this morning, and this is very important too. Salvation not only provides comfort, peace, and joy and the desire for God and His Word, but salvation provides a persevering spirit. Notice as we come back here again, and let me come to verse 1 through 5 this time. And notice here as we read this, in other words, we're going to see the marks of a true believer. The marks of a true believer. He said in verses 1 through 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that is God, that begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. And that would probably refer to Christ and the believers. And he says in verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. 
How many times have people said, oh, that's hard. That's a hard saying. That preacher's too hard. That book is too hard. That's not what God says. God says that my commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're a joy. They save us from ourselves, from the world, from the devil. God's commandments save us from harm. It's like putting a fence around the yard and putting your dogs or your goats or your animals in there to protect them from predators or getting out in the road and getting run over. God puts perimeters around for our protection. It's not for our bad. I mean, a God that loves us, He's not going to look down and say, what can I do bad for them today? I just want to whip them and hurt them today. That's not God. The things He does for us is for our good. Parents will discipline their children. In love. Why? Because they're concerned about them. God's the same way with us. He goes on to say in verse 3, For this is the love of God, and that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now I'm going to go through seven things. We have these in a sermon. I wanted to put these in an article form and never did. But I'm going to go through seven quick things that are the marks of true believers. One is, is genuine faith in Christ in the verses we just read. We find here a genuine faith in the record that God has given. The record is in verses 6 through 13. The record is is that in verse 7, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The record is that Christ came into this world and that He gave His life for us, and He that hath the Son hath life. That's the record. And so verse 1 through 5 is speaking of general, uh, I'm sorry, is speaking of believing, genuine faith in Christ, and that is, that Saving faith is an overcoming faith. We read of those that had faith in the Bible that were never saved. We find that here in this passage, this is an overcoming faith. Notice the second thing. I'm in 1 John chapter 1 again. The second thing is walking in the light. I'm just going to briefly go through these and briefly comment on them. Notice... In 1 John chapter 1, this time beginning in verse 5. Again, I got an entire sermon on this. Then we got this series just a few years ago in 1 John. So we got a lot of information on this. Verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say, a lot of people say, a lot of people are saying a lot of things. Get out and start witnessing, oh, I know the Lord, do you now? He said, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as He is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There are those that say, I know God, but they're walking in darkness. They're not walking in the will of God, in, in the Scriptures. No, they're not walking according to the Scripture. Matter of fact, many set the Scriptures aside and make up their own mind as to how they think that they are to live for God. You see, God sets the terms. God sets the terms for salvation and also for living for Him. We don't set the terms. Notice again, okay, so the first thing, one mark of a true believer is an overcoming faith. The second thing is that they're walking in the light. If somebody is not walking in the light, they're not saved. Even if they tell you they're saved and they're not walking in light, they're lying to you according to our text. Notice the the third thing is keeping the commandments as we just read. Notice in chapter 2. Notice in chapter 2 in verse 3. Hereby we do know, there's that word again, we do know that we know Him, what's the next few words? If we keep His commandments. He that saith, here's somebody else that's talking. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. 
You know what this means here? Keeping His commandments. It simply means to love and to cherish the Word of God. Is the Word of God precious to us? That's what he's saying here. Is that are we on the path of loving and following God's commandments? Now the fourth thing is in chapter 2 and in verse 9, 10, 11. And the fourth thing is, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter 2, verses 9, 10, 11 is loving other Christians. He says here in verse 9, he said, And he that saith, uh, he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother and abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. So the fourth mark of a true believer is loving other believers. Why? Because we're all the same family. We're in the same spiritual family, God's family. We're God's children. Notice again, we're going to, the fifth thing is in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And that is hating the world. Notice verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, look at this, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Notice you cannot, verse 15 and James 4 and verse 4 and other places, you cannot love the world and still yet at the same time love the Father. So one of the characteristics of the children of God is that they hate the world, the world system, and they have a love for God. When we talk about here the world, we're talking about its beliefs, its values, its its pleasures, and its morals. So, I'll just stand before you this morning by experience. I hate this world system. I'm not talking about the plants and the birds and the bees. I'm talking about this world system that is headed up by Satan. I have a hatred for that. Another thing, notice in chapter 2 and verse 29. This is number six, and that is practicing righteousness. He said in chapter 2 and verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. He's not telling you get, you get saved by doing something. He's telling you what you do when you are saved. Your pursuit is righteousness. And he, he also deals with this in chapter 3 verses 5 through 10. In other words, the saint of God does not habitually practice sin. A saint can fall into sin. A saint can make plenty of mistakes. But he does not live week after week, year after year in habitual sin. That's what these verses are telling us. There's another characteristic of the child of God. A child of God that gets in sin, God will chasten him and bring him out of that. Now, the seventh thing is back in chapter 5. Notice in chapter 5. And this time I want to read in verse um, 13, 14, and 15. And that is answered prayer. In other words, believers have a life of prayer. Believers pray. That is their life. He said in verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now notice verse 14 and 15. He says, And this is the confidence that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we will have the petitions that we desired of Him. The seventh mark of a true believer is a prayer life. They trust God, they believe God, they go to God for all their needs, they pray and seek Him. So salvation not only provides comfort, peace, and joy, and but it also provides for us a hunger and a desire for God and His Word. Matter of fact, a true believer, you don't have to be talking to Him all the time about doing what's right. They have a hunger for God. And also in our text, this third point is that it provides a persevering spirit. What do we mean by that? 
It causes us to continue. Be so easy to quit and give up. Let me give you an example. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, notice here. It'd be so easy to give up and quit. But what does God do? He gave us a divine nature. We became new creatures in Christ Jesus. He placed His Holy Ghost inside of us. You can't have the Holy Ghost inside of you and be the same and not have victory over the world. Notice now as we come to this passage. Now verse 39 is the verse I really want, but let me back up to about verse 35. Now, if you read the context, the Hebrew believers in the first century here, they endured a great fight of affliction in verse 32. They became a gazing stock in verse 33. And they also took joyfully the spoiling of their goods in verse 34. Now, let's pick up in verse 35. Here's what he's telling them. He says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Now, think about this. Your assurance, which have great recompense and reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now if I stop reading there, that would be discouraging. But notice in verse 39, but we, who is that? Believers, true believers, true born again saints of God who persevere in the faith. Notice he said, but we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. That's perseverance. That's continuing as the Apostle Paul speaks, I believe it's Colossians 1.23. He says, if you continue in the faith, the true saint of God is going to continue in the faith. Uh, we find in the parable of the sower in Matthew uh, chapter 13 and Luke chapter 8, there are those who believed, but they didn't have saving faith. And they, when things came in their life, they fell away and gave up what they had. They didn't have true saving faith. Well, turn now, please, to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, and then we're going to go to Romans chapter 10. You see, the Apostle Paul said, We who are Christians, we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Turn remember to Romans chapter 14. I want to read verse 8 and 9. The reason I want to read these two verses, let's talk for just a few moments about lordship. Lordship is evident in all believers in life and in death. Now, we've got two or three sermons on lordship. One preached two years ago titled Lordship Salvation. And I have a different definition than some do of what lordship means or lordship salvation. I believe that lordship salvation means receiving Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior, which involves repentance and faith. That's my definition of that. I remember a story a friend of mine told me. He was, he was preaching in a church in a small town in Tennessee and the pastor wanted to go knocking on doors. They went knocking on doors, and one of the doors they went to, a man asked a man, he's watching television, and he's sitting there and he's half listening to him, and the pastor mistakenly said, well, you don't want to go to hell, do you? And uh, the fellow said, no. He said, well, all you got to do is pray and receive Christ, and you go to heaven. And the pastor really didn't explain to him the truth of the gospel as he should have and repentance and, and so forth. And so this man, he prayed. And he looked at, up at him, looked back at television, and he said, that doesn't mean that I have to go to church now, does it? Now, you reckon that guy got saved? Absolutely not. You see, the lost do not commit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Even the Lord Jesus, when He preached and 
It speaks of the gospel in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, and then in verse 14 and 15, he preached repentance and faith. Believing the gospel, repenting and believing the gospel. Salvation is called the narrow way in Matthew chapter 7, not the broad way that leads to destruction. We have, once we become converted, we have a new Lord and a new Master. After conversion, we have a new Lord and a new Master. It is the turn from ourselves and our way, 1 Thessalonians 1.9. They turn from their idols to serve the true and living God. Our allegiance change. My allegiance used to be to myself and to my country. My allegiance now is to Jesus Christ. I love my country, but my allegiance is not. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ. It changes the, our roads and directions. See, there are those on that narrow road to eternal life. There are those on that broad road leads to destruction again in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Notice in Romans chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. And the reason I'm reading this, Lordship is evident in all true believers, whether it be in their life or in their death. He said in verse 8 and 9, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, and that He might be Lord both of the dead and living. Lordship. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Now, the verses I'm going to read, you can all quote them. You use them. But I want to come to this passage to point out something that we talked about two years ago when we preached the message titled Lordship Salvation. We have an article also on Lordship Salvation. But notice, first of all, as we come to verse 10, or verse 9. Let's just begin reading in verse 9. He says here in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thy heart that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there are no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we know the verse, we can quote it, we use it in witnessing, I use it. But there's something here a little more than what we usually think of when we come to this passage. I want you to notice that as we come to these verses, I just read verse 9. In order for a person to be saved, they must confess Jesus as Lord. Many say, get, you know, receive Him as Savior, then later make Him Lord of your life. I'm sorry. If he's not your Lord and Savior, he is not your Savior at all. In verse 12, it says he's the Lord over all, Jew and Gentile. And in verse 13, he says, call upon the name of the Lord. Invitation to salvation. You see, Lordship of Christ is not a secondary act after salvation, but it's an integral part of the gospel. Can't be saved without it. I can't imagine 48 plus years ago me getting on my knees in 1972, May the 15th, and calling out to the Lord and not calling out unto Him, recognizing that He is Lord and Savior. I knew nothing. But I knew that He was the God of heaven. I knew that He was Lord. I knew what I was doing when I received Him. I knew it was a change of direction. I don't even know that I'd ever heard the word repent before. But I knew that this was a crossroads in my life. It was a change of directions when I cried out unto God. And not only that, we see here the issue in verse 16 of obedience to the gospel. 
A lot of times you mention the word obedience, say, oh, you're adding works to salvation. Really? Notice in verse 16. He says here in verse 16, and they have not all obeyed the gospel. Notice that. Speaking of many of the Jews in that day, they have not all obeyed the gospel. And he talks about that uh, throughout the remaining verses. We find this issue of obedience to the gospel in Romans 1.5. It's mentioned again in Romans 6 and verse 16 and 17. It's mentioned again in Romans 16 verse 19 and 25 and 25, 26. Then he talks a great company of priests were obedient to the faith in Acts 6 and verse 7. So let me close in 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter and in chapter 2. And notice here. You see, obedience is the beginning of salvation and disobedience is connected with unbelief in the Bible. We preached a message and wrote an article titled The ABCs of Salvation. I just pulled it out the other day and and was looking at it. We put three things in here. The ABCs of salvation. A, acknowledgement. That has to do with repentance. Acknowledge my sins. And B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Confessing Him as Lord and as Savior. And C, is to call on the name of the Lord, as in Romans 10 and verse 13. And calling on the name of the Lord is not a work. It's asking God, speaking to God, praying to God, and recognizing that we're sinners and asking Him, <clears throat> to save us. So let's close in 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> and notice with me as I read from verses 6, maybe to about <clears throat> 9 or so. Now notice the wordings as we come here in this passage. And please keep in mind, what have we been talking about this morning? The assurance of salvation. Salvation provides a great comfort. It provides a desire and a hunger for God and His Word. Why? You have a divine nature in you. You're a new creature. You have the Holy Ghost dwelling in your bosom. How can you ever be the same? I told the men two weeks ago on a Friday night, I said, how can some of you use God's name in vain and then stand up and say that you're a Christian? How can you be rude and harsh and things of that nature, and stand up and say, I I love God and I know God. Those don't go together. How can you curse God with the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you? How can you be angry and want to hurt someone else with the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you? He says here in these verses, now notice the contrast between the saved and the lost. He said, beginning in verse 6, I'll tell you what, we'll just read verse 6, 7, and 8 and stop. And he says here in verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. That is, he shall not be confused or ashamed or disappointed. I have never been disappointed in the last 48 years. I'm not saying it's always easy, but I've never been disappointed. He said in verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Then he tells us in the next verse that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and we've been called out of darkness into light. We don't walk in the darkness. We walk and live in the light. Again, I've been thinking about this for the last few weeks, not just because of the mission, but I've been thinking about as I witness and talk to people, if there is no comfort in our hearts from the Lord of peace and joy, if, if, if that is not a reality, and if there is no desire for the things of God. In other words, it's always a burden. It's always 
you know, hard, you know, whatever. And if there is no perseverance, I would say get on my knees and get saved and trust the Lord. That's what I said to these men in both of these missions just a few weeks ago. Would you stand with me this morning? Dear God, we thank You this morning for Your love and mercy and grace. We thank You, Lord, that You not only just save from hell, but dear God, oh Lord, You give assurance, You give comfort, You give peace, You give joy. You, you, you even put Your desire in us. You promise that in the New Covenant in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31 that You'd put Your Spirit within us and You would cause us. You would give us a desire and hunger for Thee. And Lord, You've also, Lord, by Thy Spirit and Thy Word and Thy truth, we are overcomers by faith in Thee. Lord, we're persevering, not because of ourselves, but because, Lord, of what You've done for us. Oh, dear God, we love You. We thank You for Thy Word. Lord, help us to never get over these things. Help us to always rejoice in them. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.